Right, yes, hello again. Thank you all for coming along. Um, yes, Paul gave me a bit of an introduction. I'm a developer at, at Redgate. I've been there for about a year and a half or so. Um, if you'd like to talk to me about any of the tools that we produce, then feel free to grab me in the break or afterwards. Um, I'm not here to sell anything, so um, you're kind of safe from that. Um, I'm the founder of the Cambridge Software Craftsmanship community as well that's been running for a, a few years and um, also co-organised the uh, DDD East Anglia conference. So um, this is a conference that runs every year in Cambridge. This year it's running on the 26th of September at West Road Concert Hall. It's completely free to attend, uh, it runs all day on a Saturday. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd really love to, to see some of you along. Um, we uh, we produce the agenda based on voting from the from the local developer community, and voting is still open. So if you go to ddd.stanglia.com, then you can have a say in what you get to see at the conference at the moment. It closes on the 9th of August, which is Sunday, I think. So you've got a few days left. Um, but uh, yeah, get the votes in soon. Um, tickets will be on sale later in the month. I think the 24th of August they go on. Uh, on sale for a free event. Um, so, yeah, um, keep an eye on the website for, for details there. Um, and finally, yes, I'm on Twitter, email address. Do get in touch with any comments, questions, etc. that you've got. So, I'm here to talk about um, code craft, and I sort of wanted to talk about craftsmanship in general, really, actually. Um, and I thought I'd start off by asking you what you think craftsmanship is. Um, what does craftsmanship mean to you? What do you think of when you hear the word? Yeah? Taking care and doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Cross between art and engineering. Interesting. OK. Thank you. Skill. Mm -hmm. skill. As in developed skill. Mm. Yeah. So okay. The halfway between art and engineering one is an interesting one because I was told that the difference between arts and crafts is arts are non-repeatable things that you know, of expression, and craft is something mm -hmm. that you can do again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Thank you. Um, so, how many of you would consider this image to contain craftsmanship? The uh, the gold artifacts in there. Most of you. Okay. And how about the stonemason? Is he a craftsman? Yeah, OK. This is Herbert von Karajan conducting the Berlin Philharmonic. Is there craftsmanship visible in this picture? Yeah, not so many people. Interesting. And Andy Murray on the tennis court. How many of you think that he's exhibiting craftsmanship? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Cool. Um, so for me, all of these examples are of craftsmanship. They, uh, they are all people that have, as you said, honed their skill very carefully. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of sort of deliberate practice that has gone in. Um, taking the example of, um, of Andy Murray, he will have practiced his serves over and over again, um, ad nauseam, until he can get them in the service box without even thinking about it at sort of 120 miles an hour or something like that. Um, uh, Carrie Ann will have um, sat down and listened to the symphony that he was conducting, um, compared other performances, gone back to the score and the autographed originals and all that sort of thing to find insights and find the kind of meaning in the music and poured over all of this. Um, so, we're a technical community. Can we consider software a craft? How, how many of you in the room would consider software as a craft? Wow, awesome. That's really good. <laughs> um, so, I probably don't need to tell you about the Software Craftsmanship Manifesto. Then. Um, there's uh, a bunch of um, sort of big name signatories on it, uh, including Uncle Bob. Um, and his son, Micah Martin, uh, Corey Haynes, Dave Hoover, J.B. Rainsberger, all these kind of big names in software development that are sort of 
thought leaders in, um, in how to develop software professionally and effectively. Um, and they've all quite publicly signed this manifesto to say this is, this is what they believe. Um, and the, the thing that really sticks out for me in this, you can't really see it on there, um, the second line, professional software development. And that's the key to it for me. For me, craft and professionalism are kind of synonymous, essentially. Um, the, uh, the words on the slide are the dictionary definitions of the two words, and you can see that there is a, a sort of overlap between the two. Um, as as uh, someone said over here, craftsmanship is a desire to do a job well and purely for its own sake, really. It's the desire to take pride in your work. And so, as a result, for me, at least, professionalism and craftsmanship are, are synonyms. Um, I, I sort of look at it this way. Programming is creative. It's a skill that can be learned and developed to a very high degree, just like the tennis serves or um, the chiseling of the stone, etc. We experience a sense of achievement when we are learning um, software development, when we are improving at software development. And therefore, to a great extent, craftsmanship isn't really a luxury that we indulge in. It's actually built right into our chosen career. So I'd like to talk about the three main pillars of, of software craftsmanship as, as I see them. Um, and the first one is the sort of professional mindset, essentially. And uh, this also breaks down into three things. The first one is a sort of methodical mindset, uh, methodical nature to, um, to your development. And in this respect, we can think of it as being systematic and orderly. And uh, how many of you are fam familiar with test-driven development? Great, excellent. So test-driven development is a fantastic example of something that's very methodical. Um, there are precisely three steps to it that constitute the entire system. And it's very orderly, because they have to be uh, performed in that order. You can't refactor while you have red tests. Uh, you, can't, um, you can't write any production code if, um, if you haven't got a test to cover it, etc., etc. Um, so being very methodical about our work is, uh, is a really kind of useful way to, to approach it, I feel. I also think it's important to be quite deliberate in our work as well. Um, and by this, I mean that every step that we take has a, has a defined purpose. So again, taking the TDD example, every step in that process has a particular purpose. The red phase, the purpose is to write a test that will cover the behavior that you're adding. The green phase, obviously, is to implement that behavior so you've got something useful out of it. And the refactor phase has a purpose too, which is to ensure that your code is clean at the end of the cycle and that you're actively removing duplication of both code and concepts as you go along. And the final part of the mindset, I feel, is, um, uh, is to be very sort of considered in the, in the decisions that you take. There's someone that I work with who, um, whenever you go to him with, uh, with an idea for an improvement to, um, to the product that we're working on or whatever, uh, he, he'll challenge you and say, what alternatives have you considered? Um, and he's not doing it just to be a pain in the ass or whatever. He actually wants to know what you have discarded and why you have actively discarded it, rather than just honing in on one idea and, uh, and thinking that that must be the, the right answer. Um, so it's not just something that you've thought about. It's something that you can defend when challenged on it. I think that's, that's very important. So these three pillars of the mindset, I think, add up to a sort of mindful approach to software development. Um, and in this, I mean it as the very opposite of mindlessness, which we can all sort of imagine, a kind of automaton sat at a keyboard, a kind of code monkey type person hammering out code without really thinking that much about what they're doing, without taking that much responsibility for it. 
So as the opposite of that, we're an actively engaged participant in the software development process. And as a result, I feel we have a bit more of a responsibility to be mindful about what it is that we're doing along the way. Um, I think also that it offers you a lot of opportunities to learn from your experiences and from the wider industry as well. Um, having a, a sort of mindful attitude allows you to look out for events like this one this evening, where, um, whereas you might not otherwise be aware of them, um, and giving you an opportunity to, to learn something new. It also allows you to challenge your own principles and practices and to be prepared to have them challenged by others as well. It's, uh, it's more a case of being curious rather than self-doubt. Um, it, it can sort of appear as though with all this sort of active questioning of, of everything that we're doing, it, is it that we're just a bit kind of underconfident about what it is that we're doing? But actually, I don't, I don't think it is at all. I see it as a much more positive thing of um, curiosity about how to improve. And mindfulness, I think, actually leads to pragmatism. And this is what software craftsmanship is all about. It is at its, um, at its sort of heart, I think, a pragmatic discipline. Um, and uh, Sandro Mancuso, the uh, founder of the London Software Craftsmanship Community, wrote a book on software craftsmanship about a year ago. And he subtitled it, Professionalism, Pragmatism, and Pride. So of, evidently for him as well, these three, um, three things add up to software craftsmanship too. And I really think that with a mindful ap attitude, we have the correct mindset to be pragmatic in our choices and in our decisions at work. It's really the greatest tool that we can equip ourselves, I think. So the, the second pillar that I see is the, uh, the sort of tool belt itself. Um, what can we consider things like our, our saws and our chisels and battens and that sort of thing? Um, I'm not going to talk too much about technical tools because in some respects I, I don't find these quite as interesting. They're, um, they're kind of solve problems in many respects. Um, but these are a selection of the ones that, that I use for, for various different things. So uh, the cluster in the left-hand corner is the sort of stack that I use for C-sharp development. Um, I don't know where I'd be without NCrunch. I don't know how I ever how I ever programmed without it, and that's, that's definitely the case for, for ReSharper, as I'm sure it is for, for a lot of people. Um, I also think it's important to, to know a, a smart editor really well. Um, and depending on uh, the situation, I'll sort of switch between Atom and Vim. Um, and as an example of the sort of curiosity and um, looking for, uh, for improvements to, to your tools and what have you, um, up until about a month ago, it wouldn't have been Atom on there, it would have been Sublime Text. And having sort of tried out Atom for a bit, I found that I actually preferred that. Um, and so swapped it out into, uh, into my tool chain. Um, the ones at the bottom, if you don't recognize the logos, we've got Git. Um, you could replace that with Mercurial if you wanted. I, I think any DVCS essentially is, um, is an essential tool uh, to a software developer. Um, and uh, I, I chose Git particularly because it's the one that I've used the most. Um, it makes a bit more sense to me than Mercurial does. Um, but also you can use it as a front end to a lot of centralized source control systems as well, like Subversion and TFS and Perforce. Um, so you can get all the benefits of Git working locally whilst also being able to synchronize with whatever version control system your, your company already uses. Um, and the other one is PowerShell. This is, um, this is a tool that I picked up uh, back when it was still version one, I think about, um, uh, I don't know, about seven years ago or something. Um, it's a fantastic scripting environment for Windows that a lot of developers just don't know about at all. Um, and particularly if you're familiar with the um, uh, 
the Unix stack and Bash and all that sort of thing, you'll find a lot of the aliases uh, um, still available in PowerShell. So you can use ls and cat and what have you um, directly in, in PowerShell. Uh, so it's quite familiar. And, um, and you get all the benefits of, of a scripting environment. You can automate a lot of your uh, sort of day-to-day -day tasks that, uh, that might otherwise be a bit, bit laborious to, to carry out. Um, so yeah, if you haven't tried PowerShell already, do, do give it a go. Syntax is a bit clunky, but you can't have everything. Um, so there's, um, there's a bunch of delivery tools, actually, and I've just been reminded that I've got a quotation to read. Um, this is Salisbury Cathedral. It's one of the, um, one of the oldest buildings in the, in the country. It was built in the... 1200. Um, and I want to read you a quotation about the construction of it. This is The Craftsman by Richard Sennett, a um, sociologist, I think he is. Um, it's, it's quite a dry book, but it's a really interesting read at the same time. So, um, yeah, if, if you want to have a read, do, um, do give it a go. So, the immense Salisbury Cathedral began in 1220 to 25 as a set of stone posts and beams that established the Lady Chapel at the end of the future cathedral. The builders had a general idea of the cathedral's eventual size, but no more. However, the proportions of the beams in the Lady Chapel suggested a larger building's engineering DNA and were articulated in the big nave and two transepts built from 1225 to about 1250. From 1250 to 1280, this DNA then generated the cloister, the treasury, and the chapter house. In the chapter house, the original geometries meant for a square structure were now adapted to an octagon in the treasury to a single-sided vault. Sorry, a six-sided vault. How did the builders achieve this astonishing construction? There was no one single architect. There were no blueprints. Rather, the gestures with which the building began involved in principles and were collectively managed over three generations. Each event in building practice became absorbed in the fabric of instructing and regulating the next generation. I really think that's agile development applied to cathedral building. They solved the initial problem by building a small chapel where people could go to worship. And they laid the foundations within that building for the much larger structure so that it was obvious how the rest of the cathedral could be built, just from what was already there. There was no need for one person managing the thing overall. And that wouldn't have been possible, even. If it's going to take 100 years to build or something in totality, you can't have one person in the Middle Ages doing that, because life expectancy was about 50 years. Um, and everything was Cut, um, passed down from, through the generations by the, um, by the builders along the way. And it was all done so through the, through the fabric of the building. And I think that's, that's really quite, quite something. I think there's, there's a lot to be learned from that approach, really. Um, it is, I think, a minimum viable cathedral. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Um, so this is what I consider the equivalent for software development. This is a story map. Uh, how many of you have come across user story mapping? A couple of you. OK. So um, this is a two-dimensional backlog, essentially. Across the top, you have the workflow that the user follows through, uh, through a system. In this case, it's, uh, it's an email client. And going down the vertical axis, you have the, uh, the sort of implementations, the features that you can add to each of those steps in the workflow. That, uh, that are organized by priority. So the things that you have to do in order to be able to complete the task at all go at the top. The things that are sort of embellishment and um, uh, sort of nice to haves and that sort of thing come further down. And then you can draw lines through the story map to identify what your first version is going to be, what your second version is going to be, etc. as we've done. So, so you can see, uh, for example, that um, under managing email, we've got uh, composing email, create and send a basic email and send RTF 
email rich text format. It's, um, yeah, that's pretty much the, the basic that you can do for, for sending an email. Um, and then in release two, we add uh, HTML email and uh, being able to, to set the priority of the email and stuff, things that are used less often, essentially. But the nice, really, really nice thing about this um, is that you end up with a properly usable product after each iteration of it. So even the first release is completely usable because you've built out the entire workflow for the user. Um, and we used this on a project at work recently that, um, that worked really successfully with it, actually. We, um, we managed to, uh, we'd had a few problems with um, having sort of user stories defined as uh, to technical implementations rather than as, as sort of problems to solve. Um, we'd, had, um, we'd had sort of similar problems with building features that were uh, kind of only half usable because they were half complete and that sort of thing. Um, and we ran this on, on our team to, uh, to build a new feature into it, uh, the SQL source control product, and it worked fantastically. After the first release, we had a completely usable feature. The second release added um, some, some sort of embellishments and some improvements to it, and we were able to get uh, actual user feedback from the first version of it that we were then able to plow into the second one. So uh, sort of UX testing and beta releasing the first version and that sort of thing actually allowed us to reprioritize the stuff lower down. And that proved invaluable because we found that, um, that there was one thing that we thought would probably be needed but may we might be able to get away with. Actually, after the user experience testing that we ran, we found that it was actually essential and that we couldn't get away without um, including that in the, in the final full release of the feature. Um, so yeah, being able to, to sort of validate the, the minimum viable product across the top and uh, work out what goes into the second release, the third release, et cetera, along the way is, is invaluable. Um, so looking at the story map again from a, a slightly more sort of high level, I guess. Across the top, the orange post-it notes, you have the user activities. These are the very kind of high level uh, things, the sort of categories of uh, tasks that the user can complete in your application. The, the blue ones across the middle, um, they're the tasks that the user can, can complete. So these are much more user focused than the, than the activities in as much as they're much more uh, kind of tangible, essentially. Um, and the guy that uh, did this diagram, he turned that the, the walking skeleton. I'm, I'm in two minds about the use of that term there because thinking about the way uh, the authors of growing object-oriented software talk about a walking skeleton, for example, um, I would imagine that it's, it's something more along these lines in some respects uh, because... because the walking skeleton actually has to be produced. It needs to run and do something. Uh, whereas the blue line across the top here is more, what are the things, what are the components of this particular workflow, essentially? Um, and then the yellow post-it notes are the user stories that sort of define the, the detail of each of the tasks. Um, you can run this exercise for all sorts of things. Uh, there's a, I think it's, it's probably not a video, but there's, um, I think there's documentation somewhere online about how this was run at a conference to uh, map out the activities of uh, making breakfast in the morning um, as a sort of um, introduction to the topic, essentially. Um, so if you want a sort of fairly gentle introduction to it, then you could try running breakfast or something with, with your team on it. Um, or try it out for, for a single feature, as we did at Redgate. It's, um, yeah, it works just as well for that as it does for full products or whatever. Um, so, yeah, give, give that one a, a go, I'd say. Um, some of you may recognise this slide from when I was last here. Um, I, I want to say a little bit about TDD. Um, 
I, I don't think it's always appropriate. And sometimes more can be appropriate, such as acceptance test-driven development. And sometimes less can be, uh, something like um, Dan North's spike and stabilize technique. Um, and uh, there's, there's also further developments along these lines. If you've seen um, the blog post that Benji Weber of Unruly Media wrote about modern XP, he talks about monitoring driven development and how in a sort of SaaS business, the, the monitoring uh, metrics that you put in can be more effective as tests than acceptance tests or um, unit tests as a kind of initial stab at a solution. <clears throat> I think that's a really interesting evolution of the technique. So um, if you're working in that kind of space, I'd recommend having a read of, of the post. So the basic idea of, of, um, of test-driven development is, as Kemp Beck himself put it, make it work and then make it right. Um, and that really ties into the thing on the slide. Perfect is a verb. It's a process that you go through to, um, to make your software better. It's not a goal to aim for. Um, and there's a few sort of uh, guidelines, I guess, that I like to work to when I'm, uh, when I'm practicing TDD. Um, and the first one, in, well, in each phase of the test, the, in the red phase, I'd like to write just enough of a test to fail. So I'm not writing more test code than I actually need. I'm writing the minimum amount of test code that will, uh, that will sufficiently test the scenario and cause it to fail. Um, I, I count compilation failures as, as a test failure when necessary because if it's the very first test that you write for the system before you've ever written it, you haven't got any code to test. So you're going to have compilation failures. Um, but what I do when I'm when I'm treating the compilation failure as a test is um, stub out the code and ensure that I return something noddy that causes the test to fail for the right reason. So if I'm writing a, a method that returns a Boolean and expects false, then I'll return true from that to ensure that it fails correctly. Um, I run all of the tests all of the time uh, because you're only expecting one test to fail in the red phase. If you've broken, an, if you've got more than one failing test, then you've broken some tests, and um, yeah, you, ne you need to fix those before you can make your, your new test pass. Sorry, you run all of the tests. Yes. All of the time. All of the unit so you're tests. Just working on, on one block. Uh, yes. Yeah, because NCrunch makes it super easy to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, at the, at the green phase, write just enough code to, to pass the failing test and no more. Um, and that does mean for the sort of super simple case when you've got your first tests right, uh, written, it is just a case of return true if that's enough to make the test pass. Um, and yeah, run, run all of the tests again at the green phase as well. And as I say, with NCrunch, you don't have to worry about that. It just does it for you all of the time. Um, in refactoring, I like to use duplication as the main driver for, for refactoring um, and sort of weeding that out quite, um, uh, quite aggressively um, can help you find some of the concepts in your code that, that might be hiding otherwise. Um, and there's also the, the sort of tidy up kind of things that you can do to um, sort of uh, fix variable names and extract methods and, and that sort of thing. Um, object orientation. I'm not going to talk a lot about functional programming because, to be honest, I don't know that much about it. Um, but uh, I've been doing object-oriented programming for, for quite a while now, and I've done a lot of reading about it. And there's, there's a lot of stuff in object orientation that, uh, that I think is often overlooked when, when actually developing. Um, and I think the overall thing that I'd like to, to say under, under this particular slide is, is, yes, know your language well, but know your language's paradigm better. 
so that you can be productive in any object-oriented language or any functional language. Um, so the, the sort of key realizations that I had about object orientation that, um, uh, that, that have really stuck with me. The, the first one is that um, Alan Kay, one of the uh, creators of Smalltalk and object-oriented programming initially, um, has said that he, if given his time again, he'd go back and rename it to message-oriented programming because he feels the term object orientation has led to uh, an overemphasis on the sort of class side of things, um, the the kind of modelling of the state rather than the behaviour. Um, and as far as small talk is concerned, in in particular, the the messaging and the behaviour of the objects is the thing that's really important. It's the thing that really drives the application. And I think that carries over into other languages too, actually, because. If you don't have behavior in your application, what does it actually do? There's, there's nothing there. It just sort of fires up a bunch of state and sits there, I guess. Um, so there's these two uh, camps of object orientation, essentially. There's um, classist and behavioral. Um, and the, the behavioral object orientation, in my opinion, is, is much more interesting and much more powerful. Um, in the behavioral object orientation camp interfaces are contracts of behavior. So they don't expose state on them. So if, for example, in, in C Sharp, if you've, got, uh, if you've got an interface with properties on it, um, then you're exposing state on that interface rather than behavior. And maybe it's a case of refactoring that into a, a sort of DTO or something. Um, there's the usual gang of four advice as well. Uh, favor composition over inheritance and program to the interface and not the implementation. And the, the sort of reasoning behind this essentially is to um, create lots of Lego blocks that you can then stick together to make up the, uh, the behavior of your application and decouple everything into, um, into reusable chunks. Um, and the, the systems that I've seen and built along these patterns are, are actually really nice to work with because all your classes end up very small. Things like the single responsibility principle are actually quite easy to follow when taking this kind of approach because there's, there's only so many kinds of messages that you can respond to and so many um, behaviors that you can expose before it, it gets unmanageable. Um, and there's there's help from the Gang of Four as well in terms of achieving the loose coupling. Um, do know or revise, if you already know them, the design patterns that are in the Gang of Four because they are phenomenally useful. Um, for loose coupling, you can uh, use a strategy or an adapter composite pattern. Um, many more decorators, etc., are, are really your friends to achieve this. Um, Assuming nothing about an implementation is, is a really important um, step to take when, when implementing an in interface because it then allows the Liskov substitution principle to work for you uh, rather than having to kind of work out how to, um, how to uh, adhere to it, essentially. Um, yeah, the, the patterns I really feel are an OO programmer's bricks and mortar. Um, if you if you are familiar with functional programming, or if you, uh, or even if you aren't, um, do explore it because actually it does make uh, design patterns clearer. Um, things like the strategy pattern is just a way of injecting a function into another function when the language doesn't support first class functions. A lot of the design patterns bring functional concepts to object oriented languages that. Um, uh, that aren't natively supported. So, yeah, I've, I have functional programming on my list of things to learn. I'm sort of exploring F sharp a bit at the moment. Um, I'd encourage you to, to do the same if you're not already. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say about object orientation is that there is a spectrum of abstraction. And do, do respect that when, when programming. Um, by that, I mean even, even a class is an abstraction. 
it's not just interfaces and abstract classes. A class itself is an abstraction as well. Because the only concrete thing you have is an instance, an object, an instance of the class, because that's the only thing that is actually running. Classes and abstract classes and interfaces are all tools for modeling the concepts in your system and as such are abstractions. Um, right, yes, the next, next delivery tool. Um, all software development is either writing legacy code or wrangling it. I'll let you discuss that later. Um, because of that, we need a way to refactor it. And there's a lot of help available for refactoring. There's ReSharper, there's, uh, there's uh, IntelliJ, there's, um, yeah, all sorts of tools to, to help you automate your refactorings. And that does make life a lot easier. Um, something else that I've tried a couple of times is uh, something called the Mikado method, which is a way of taking the sort of methodical, incremental, uh, discipline kind of approach that you get from TDD and applying it to refactoring. Uh, the thing that, the, the way it works is that you essentially drill down through your refactoring and all its dependencies um, to the simplest change that you can make and then work your way back up again. So the process is to, uh, I'll put up a better slide in a minute, but the, the overall process is to set a refactoring goal, um, implement a, a really naive approach to satisfying that. Note all the dependencies that that goal has, so all the compilation errors that you introduce by, um, uh, by doing the naive implementation, all the failing tests, etc. Um, and with all your dependencies noted, revert the change so that you can then pick one of those dependencies as your next level and go at that and repeat. What you end up with at the end is, uh, is what the, uh, the authors of the book term the Mikado graph. Um, and this, I think, is actually a really valuable artifact to the process um, because it's a record of your thoughts. So when you get back on Monday morning, halfway through a refactoring, you have an idea of where it was that you got to. And more than that, you've got a picture that gives you all of the context of where you got to as well. It's an indication of your progress. So you can put it up on your team's board or whatever um, so, that, uh, so that if you're doing a very large refactoring, um, sort of a, a redesign of, a, of one part of your system or something like that, uh, you can actually visualize the progress that you're making with that because um, the, the tree sort of grows and you cross them off and what have you. Um, so you can see how far through it you've got and how much it's sort of exploding and that sort of thing. Um, it's also a focusing tool. It allows you to, um, to remain focused on the goal at hand and not get distracted into... Um, side refactorings of, oh yeah, I've just opened this class up and that's really horrible too, so let's make a refactoring of that as well. I get a bit um, caught up in that sometimes. So I really, like the, um, I really like the Mikado method as a way of focusing me on the, uh, on the particular job in hand. Um, and finally, I think it's a really good learning tool, um, particularly if you're picking up a new code base actually, because it exposes the coupling and the dependencies between the modules in your application, or at least the ones that you're working with in the refactoring. Um, and so you can go back to your Mikado graphs later, later on. Um, I've got a, a sort of is it a, A4, A3, a fairly sizable book, um, where I've drawn out Mikado graphs for the various refactorings I've done. Um, and I can go back to those at a later point and see that actually these things are coupled in this way and those things are coupled in that way um, and maybe all of those things as well are coupled in this third way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, can, I can pick up that knowledge again when it's gone a bit stale. I can share it with other people in the team, etc. cetera. Um, so to, uh, to walk through the, the process of, um, in a little bit more detail, as I say, 
we start off by drawing the Mikado goal, and that's um, that's like a ball on on a piece of paper, essentially, and you write in it, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and so that might be, for example, uh, say you pass in um, a database connection string as an argument to, uh, no, sorry, say the database connection string is hard-coded into your application and you want to pass it in as a command line argument. That is your Mikado goal. And you implement that naively by stripping it out of your, um, out of your main method and taking it from the, um, from the arguments. Um, and you see that, yes, there are some errors doing that because now these tests fail and these compilation errors have occurred. So uh, step four, come up with immediate solutions to the errors. Um, just work out what it is. Sometimes it's obvious, quite often it's obvious what you need to do. So it might be that you need to um, actually pass the argument into the application, for example, um, or something like that. Um, and those solutions then become prerequisites of the Mikado goal. So to your ball with the Mikado goal, you add however many problems you found underneath it and draw arrows linking it. Uh, so you end up with a, a sort of tree structure. Once you've got everything noted, revert your changes because you're going to go through them another level down. Um, select the next prerequisite to work with. Um, yeah, pick one of those and, and go through the process again. Eventually, you'll get to a point where the change that you've, <coughs> you've made actually compiles and passes the test. Um, and if that makes sense, then now you can commit it to your version control system because you've finished that chunk of work. If it doesn't make sense, then there's still more work to do. So you can go back to um, your Mikado graph and pick another prerequisite to work with. Um, yeah, if you, yeah, when you commit your changes, if the Mikado goal is met, then obviously you're, you're done at that point. There's nothing else to do. Um, OK, cool. Uh, I'll skip through the rest of it very quickly then. Um, yeah, pair programming is great, but code review is still needed, I think. Um, there's uh, fantastic coaching and mentoring to be done in, um, in pair programming and code reviews. Um, if you're pairing regularly, try mob programming instead, or possibly the Randori method. Um, to kind of mix things up a bit and turn it up to 11. Um, I'll, uh, I'll happily talk to anyone about those in the, in the break or whatever. Um, the third pillar, <laughs> oh dear, um, is personal responsibility. Um, this is a model that is defined by Christopher Avery as part of his leadership gift program. Um, there are many stages of responsibility and these are very similar to the five stages of grief or the six stages of debugging. <laughs> the difference with pers personal responsibility is that at any point before we take responsibility, we have the option uh, of quitting the situation and abdicating it. Um, so personal responsibility with bug fixing as an example. Um, denial, there's no way that could happen. Laying blame, this is Joey's code, it's his fault. Justification. Well, if Joey hadn't used null values in his code, then there would be no bug. Shame. I'm such an idiot. I saw Joey working on this just last week, and I didn't say anything. Obligation. There's no way we could have done anything different. We're under such pressure to deliver on time that quality just goes out the window. Responsibility. I'll have a chat with Joey to explain why nulls should be avoided and start trialing code reviews as part of our development process. Um, this kind of ties back into what I was saying at the beginning about the mindset. Um, being mindful will help a lot in taking personal responsibility because um, if you're mindful, you, are, you can be aware of which phase of this you are in. Um, and using that knowledge allows you to reach a productive conclusion more quickly. So, in conclusion, there are three pillars to software craftsmanship. Spot the off by one error if you can. Um, mindset is methodical, deliberate, and considered. 
there's the pillar of tools, both tool pleh, technical and delivery slash process. And responsibility, which I blitzed through very quickly, sorry. Um, owning your context and involvement in your work, being um, an engaged participant in the team. The second pillar provides a way to express the other two. Any amateur can use a professional's tools, but it's the approach that we take to our work that indicates professionalism and denotes craftsmanship. Thank you very much for listening. Do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah. No, yeah. Questions. Any questions? No? Excellent. Okay. Graph. Yes. Sorry. Do you, um, I was just thinking, is that something you can use when you mentioned earlier about a lot of developers might just come up with a single solution and not consider their, you know, the alternatives? Mm. Um, is that something where you can think of what the alternatives are and then maybe use the old uh, Mikado graph to actually have an idea of which one to pick? Is that kind of something you uh, can maybe use that for? Yes, I think you probably could use it for that. Um, it's, yeah, there are, at, at any stage on the Mikado graph, I think there's different ways of um, of implementing each prerequisite or, or the um, or the goal itself even um, and and so yes you can you can use that as as a sort of aid to your decision making I think hmm. any other yep the Randori method R A N D O R I Story mapping. Mm. How do you avoid too much, or, or don't you really? Because maybe it's more of a brainstorming thing and to map things out. But I just wonder if there's a feeling of doing maybe too much upfront design when you're trying to be a bit mm. agile and when you want to keep things high level. You don't want to go into too much detail because you mm. want to hit that when you actually do the iterations. But when you do yep. the, the story mapping, it almost looks like you've got massive wall of things and that email client looks great but mm -hmm. if you're talking like a six month nine month twelve month project that yeah how do you get that balance um so yes i i take your point the the thing that i like about it is that all of the things across the top are user tasks they're things that the user wants to complete actions um the, the yellow stickies are ways of achieving those actions, um, either completely different ones or, um, as I say, embellishments to an existing one. Um, and then where you, where you draw the line determines how much you, you put in, essentially. So, um, yes, there is, uh, there is a a danger that you essentially draw your release one here and try and pull the entire story map in. Um, but that, I think, comes down to um, sort of discussions with product management and that sort of thing too. I was thinking about it now. Is that maybe where you have the moderator in your workshop and they basically draw the line of too much detail? Um, Possibly. So, so something that's not on here that we did in, um, in the story mapping on my team at work was we estimated um, in very broad terms how long we thought each release would take. Um, and I think they each came out at, at two or three sprints or thereabouts, um, which, which was pretty accurate in terms of, um, in terms of actual delivery. Um, and we had we had an idea that what was it we had i think a budget of two months development time or something like that um so so the product manager actually found this really valuable because they could see that they'd have something that they could actually ship to users after two sprints um it was a bit of a shame it wasn't one sprint but there was a lot of kind of groundwork to do initially um so, yeah, the, 
it, it feeds very nicely into the iterative nature of agile delivery, I think, because you can, you can say this is what we need for the first one and then work out how long that's likely to take and then this is what we need for the second one. Okay. Can we just leave it there? Cool. Okay, cheers.